This is the final lecture in our series this year, and I want to dedicate this lecture to my great friend and comrade, the late Sheikh Antadio. No one, in fact, in recent times, perhaps no one in any time, has devoted so much of his wisdom, his skill, and his energy to establishing Egypt, not only as the center and font of African civilization, but as the source of the greatest light and power in the early world. The lecture tonight is entitled The African Origin of Egyptian Civilization. And I shall not only dwell on this, on the evidence we have now that establishes beyond the shadow of a doubt that Egypt was an African civilization, but I shall seek to show the tremendous impact on European civilization and even early American civilization that the Egyptians wrought. And even beyond this, I want to deal with the origins of man himself or herself. Man was born in Africa. We know this now, and we've known this for some time. Nobody disputes that. That is not what is in dispute. Everyone accepts this. The British Queen, about two or three weeks ago, was in Africa, and she said, my ancestors are African. <laughs> of course, when I was a boy, I don't think she would have said that with the same kind of ease. However, that is not what is in dispute. What is being said is that although man was born in Africa, European man and Asian man are far removed from the early Africans. What they are arguing is that man was born in Africa, yes, but when he came to Europe, he evolved into a more advanced creature. And those who were left back in Africa, they deteriorated or remained static. And so the European or the Asian developed and evolved the higher states and then eventually came back to the benighted African left back in the dust and brought him civilization. So that even though it has been established scientifically that man was born in Africa, it has, it has been used against us. However, something far more important has been discovered. And the strange thing is that the discovery is made by people who just a generation ago would have seriously question any suggestion that man, not only man was born in Africa, but modern man was born in Africa. About a dozen, 11 to be exact, scientists, most of them from Oxford, one of them from Nigeria, from Lucy, established through a study of DNA polymorphisms, these are Hymus uh, typology studies, they established two studies of the blood that not only was man born in Africa, but modern man was born in Africa. In other words, the man that inhabits this planet today, the man that is at the most sophisticated and advanced stage, all man inhabiting this planet today with the brain case of modern man is African. In, on February the 7th, nature announced this, and let me explain to you what it means. They have discovered that there are six stages of man. All of these stages are found in Africa, nowhere else. The last three stages, however, moved out of Africa, and they're found not only in Africa, they're found in Europe, they're found in Asia. They are African, but they disappear. There is, for example, Homo erectus, which gave way to Neanderthal man, and then after Neanderthal man came the modern man we know today, the last phase of man, a Grimaldi type, as he's known in Europe, Homo sapiens sapiens. Now that man had the brain case and capacity of modern man. He was born about 100,000 years ago, and we find him in Ethiopia and parts of Southern Africa. He begins to migrate because this is the hunting and gathering phase, and as man, de man exploits his food supply and it seems exhausted, he moves on and moves on and moves on. That is how he got into Europe and that is how he got into Asia. Now, 
Europe is only about 20 miles from Africa, and the, there was a land bridge or a connection between Western Asia and Africa. It was only afterwards that that split a little so that you had to cross by sea to India. So that there is a reason, there is an explanation for how man migrated slowly into these regions. Now, what these scientists have established that no man on earth no man exists in Europe, no man exists in Asia 55,000 years ago. It's not only was modern man born in Africa, the last phase of man, but no other man existed on the earth but Africans until about 55,000 years ago. European man began to emerge out of African man in the ice. This is an ice age known as the worm interstadium. It is a specific period in which an extreme condition exists. It is not simply temperate climates as we, we exist in now. These are extreme conditions where great parts of Europe are covered by sheets of ice, and then something begins to happen to the African type of man. In some areas, and it is supposed to be somewhere near southwestern Russia, and in the Caucasian steppes, the steppes of the Caucasus, man begins to undergo some kind of change. It is a superficial change. He becomes an albino. Now, this is not unusual even today. In Africa, you can have a completely pigmentless type born to an African without mixture. In other words, Africans can give birth to pink people. White cannot give birth to blacks unless they mix because Africans are the original man. The need for pigmentation, blackness or brownness is the fact that man was born in the equatorial regions. The ultraviolet radiation of the sun, which is more intense in those regions, insists it, you must have a pigmentation shield in order to deal with that radiation. We are once again approaching something like that in the climate of the world. There is a hole in the ozone layer now which has been produced by the misuse of certain resources like the use of fluorocarbons, etc. As a result of that, within the last 10 years, there has been an increase of 20% of skin cancer among whites in tropical and subtropical regions because there is no protection against the growing ultraviolet radiation which is now falling once again upon the planet. In the ice, this became a problem because pigmentation in the far ice doesn't by shielding one from sunshine, abundant sunshine, which doesn't exist in those regions, became a disadvantage. It became a disadvantage because the mineralization of the bones needs the photosynthesis of vitamin D. To do this, you must get a certain amount of sunlight. In those regions, the European had to cover himself with the skins of animals. He had to live largely in caves. He lived in a climate which was not only colder but darker, farther away from the thrust and shock of the sun. As a consequence, pigmentation began to fall off so that you have albino types. They still have African type features, but they are albino in the sense that they have no pigmentation shield. Later on in the ice, you have a tendency to contraction. Ice contracts, heat expands. So you have expansive types of features, broader noses, fuller lips, etc., in tropical and subtropical um, regions, and you have narrow noses, thinner lips in regions of the ice. So that you eventually get an ice type and a sun type. Now, some people believe, and this is being um, preached by people like Press Welsin and Dr. King and others that in this mutation which occurred producing the so-called white man or caucasoid that certain damage occurred and they believe that there is something called the pineal gland which feeds on melanin but because of the calcification of melanin in the European, you have a calcification of the pineal gland. Okay, I'm not going to get into that. I personally do not believe in 
biological difference between races. One of the things that has been established by recent discovery is that there are no inferior or superior races that manage one family. There is no question, however, because of history that we cannot see man simply as one family since we are a member of that family that has been oppressed for centuries. We cannot look lightly and casually on this matter and make an idealistic or idyllic statement saying all men are one. This is true in a biological sense. But I want you to be aware of the fact that our history has produced divisions among races, divisions among groups that are deep and frightening and that we cannot really heal them we cannot really come to a balance, a true balance, until we begin to understand everyone, not just blacks, until we, the human race, begins to understand the nature of that history, to have a different vision of that history, so that the kind of contempt which has excluded us, the kind of contempt which discriminates now against us, the kind of contempt which has reduced our, the status and stature of our people, vanishes. Until that happens, we have to take a militant stance on all these matters. We cannot avoid that merely by drowning ourselves in idyllic statements about the unity of man. The unity of man is real, but it is not yet with us. It is important to understand that even if it were true what Press Wilson said or Dr. King or whoever, that we do have certain advantages of melanin in one state, you would have a balancing occurring. A mutation may initially be damaging or maybe a disadvantage, but then it becomes a stabilizing force so that you can't speak of races being inferior. There is no such thing. Once that adaptation is made, that race stabilizes itself in that way. So you do have Caucasoid types, Mongoloid types, and Africoid types. It is very important to understand that because over the last five centuries, perhaps more in some places, that the Caucasoid type, which had not the break that the Africoid type had in the beginnings of the world, nor in the ancient period, nor even the medieval period, that that type, having seized power, has reduced the Africoid type. All over the world, even where we are independent, we have been forced to undergo extraordinary pressures and punishments. And we cannot change that situation until we begin to understand the nature of our history. Diop was very much aware of that, very much aware that the fragmentation that exists in many parts of Africa is not only due to the colonial experiments, not only due to the colonial period, but it is due to the colonization of the imagination. It's due to things that continue to divide our people all over the world because they do not understand the common roots from which they spring and the pride that they should know in looking at those roots. That lack of pride, that lack of understanding of where they come from profoundly affects them. I get letters, I have got many letters over the years from psychotherapists, from prisoners, even in solitary confinement from doctors who show the profound effect on the psyche of reading about our history in the way it is now being presented. Some of my books, some of the books I have edited have been used in prisons and have been used in psychotherapeutic sessions and they have had a distinct effect in changing people. So history is not something about dead past. This past is not dead. We are a living continuum. What has happened in the past affects us now. It affects our thinking. It affects our prejudices. It affects our reflexes. It affects what we are. We are fed by that past. That is the food we eat. That is the food of our mind. We are fed by that past, and we therefore have to make a serious effort to understand it, to grasp it. And I don't mean it to grasp it in any hollow and general way, 
Beyond any lecture that may give some guideline or outline, you have got to read these books. You have got to acquaint yourself with these facts because as soon as they are proven and presented, they are challenged and attacked. In our schools again and again and again, so that our students, even after these things are presented to them, when they are challenged, they lose contact with the truth because they do not learn it properly. They just hear Africans have done great things, but if you ask them what specifically did they do, they don't know because they take this simply as sessions in which they are entertained or inflated by talk of achievements. But when you ask them after what is the nature of that achievement, what impact it really had on the world, they know nothing. They have forgotten. It's just like a little, little drug they take that puffs them up for a while, and then when reality faces them, they can't deal with it. I have known cases in my own school, in my own university, after giving long lectures on the origin of Egyptian civilization, a white girl writes in the newspaper, everybody knows that the European, that the Egyptians are bona fide Caucasoids. And you know, no black student who'd listen to me could reply to that. They want me to reply to it. I'm not there to do that. I can't do those things. I have my own research to do. That is your duty. This is a crusade. Jesus set down, Jesus set down the guidelines for a different kind of life, a different kind of consciousness, and then he went. It was his disciples who had to spread that word across the world. Everyone had to understand in their own way as best as they could and spread that word and challenge that system because no one person can do that. This is a vicious system. These lies are spread everywhere. They challenge everything. All of our children are involved in this. They go into those schools and they're poisoned from day one. The films they see, the books they read, the music they hear beats them down into the ground until they don't even know the difference, many of them, between noise and music. <laughs> For centuries it was argued that Egypt, which Everyone knew, all scholars knew, had a profound influence on European civilization, could not possibly be African. Now, in the early stages, when the Europeans attacked Africa, when the Greeks, the founding head of European civilization, attacked the Egyptians, the Greeks were appreciative. Even though they attacked the Africans, they were amazed and they were respectful. Many of the Greek scholars came to Africa. Thales of Miletus, Democritus, Pythagoras, Eudocius, Anaximander, Anaximenes, they all came and sat at the foot of African teachers. Even though the Europeans had attacked, they didn't destroy the African. That is one invasion in which the Europeans realized that they were not as advanced as the African. Hence, instead of destroying what they saw, they sat and learned. Pythagoras went among the Africans, as they said, for 22 years, learning medical systems as well as geometry, learning other things as well. Isaac Newton, the greatest of European scientists, tells us that at that time the Africans had prefigured things that he was to bring together for Europe much later. He said the Africans already had a heliocentric theory Heliocentric relates to the sun as center of the solar system. We all notice that today we take it for granted the sun is the center of the solar system. Europeans didn't know that. They thought the earth was the center of the solar system. He said that the Africans already had an atomic theory. They called atoms monads. Now that is a very extraordinary thing because the atom is the building block of the universe. 
They had a mystical concept of it which was barren because the atom, even though we know that is the cell of God, we know that is the building block of the physical universe, there is something inside of it. As we probe it deeper and deeper, we find that even though it is so small that you can't see it, there is even inside the core of it, there is something else, the quark. And when you probe the quark, there is something else. In other words, the mystery of the universe doesn't become less as you become the greatest scientist. The greater scientist you become, the more you become aware of mystery. You are aware that there's something essentially magical about the universe so that it doesn't end with matter. It's as, as Thierhard de Sharda pointed out, Thierhard de Sharda pointed out, that there is almost spirit. Spirit almost has another atomic structure. There is an interior structure to the exterior structure. There is the mystical atom beneath the physical atom. Now, I don't want to get involved in all that metaphysics, but I want you to be aware that they have even found waves of probability in matter so that when you all plot it out mathematically, and you say, well, if an atom does such and such, such and such happen, then you find somewhere else in the universe it didn't happen like that. In other words, there is something essentially uncatchable, ungraspable about the mystery of the universe. The Egyptians, the early Egyptians, the African dominated period, dealt with all of these things. Their mysteries are, even today, we have not yet had any serious book done to explain some of the things they were involved in. But Isaac Newton pointed also to the fact that they had a sense of gravitational field, that the harmony of the spheres which the Pythagoreans who had been affected by the Egyptians brought over into Greece indicated the Africans knew there were certain fixed orbits, that there were certain forces that attracted and held certain things in place. Now these things make us aware that that early period was dominated by a certain kind of genius. Genius is not necessarily having a higher level of brain. It is a certain focus of cerebral energy. Many of us are shattered people. We are involved in a very broken world. The capacity, therefore, to think like a laser beam is missing in most of us. That doesn't mean we don't have the capacity to do that. Many of us operate at low level, partly because we believe we are low level people, because we don't have a sense of real history, and partly because we're living in societies where it is easy for a low level operating person to get by. It is very important that you understand that the brain is an incredible organ. It is absolutely incredible. What you possess is very important and you do not become aware of the power that lies within you unless you become aware of the power that lies outside of you. You have to feel this connection. It is very important because when I set out on this trek, I was very ashamed of having African blood, very, very ashamed. I looked around the world, I never saw anything important about Africans. I was trained in the British world, I never read any book. I never read any book that convinced me or persuaded me that the Africans did anything. There was nothing. In my libraries there was nothing on African civilization. That's an absurdity, even today. When people write from universities and libraries all over the world, they don't believe my book is called Journal of African Civilization. They say Journal of African Studies or Journal of African Culture because the word African and civilization don't go together. <laughs> I'm serious. This, this, is, this is in the human, this has become part of the human tragedy. When I was growing up as a boy, there were no African models Nobody ever talked about the only African I knew is the African in Tarzan movies. There was no other African. All Africans were half-naked savages who came out of the trees. We were made to believe that. We believed that all the time. We never saw any different. I never saw any newspaper showing me any important African. None. 
The first time I read a book by an African and I was startled by its sophistication was Jomo Kenyatta. I was studying anthropology. I had to read Facing Mount Kenya. When I read Facing Mount Kenya, I couldn't believe that was an African road map. I couldn't believe it. When you see Kenyatta fair in Ali Majru, he's African. Look how he deals with Kenyatta. He just shows you a little splash. Bam, he's gone. You wouldn't think a man of great stature, a major anthropologist, and a leader who broke the who was the beginning of the breaking of the British Empire. If it that was Gandhi, Majru, he wouldn't deal with him like that. But they, he doesn't want to deal with anything significant in Africa. When you're dealing with problems, that they, people love problems. When you're dealing with black people, they're either problems in the present or primitives in the past. That's the focus. Please understand. Masrui is, is very good when it comes to political time. But when it comes to history, he knows absolutely nothing about the history of Africa. And when, what he knows, he suppresses automatically. When he comes to dealing with Kenya and he goes to Matsui, he mentions a few things about Mama, but you never see, and there's so many clips, beautiful film clips of Kenya in his glory. You don't see that. The African is never to be presented in his glory. He's only to be presented as a sick man, a beaten man, a slave or a colonial, or a primitive. You cannot grow out of such images. You can never feel pride in any such image. You have to balance it against something else. We are aware of how horror is occurring in modern Africa. But you can't just be aware of the horror. You have to be aware of the great achievement of the African. You have to balance these things. You cannot just look at the edge or periphery of the African world. You have to look also at the core and center. If there is anything I have brought to anthropology, it is that. The absolute insistence, the passionate insistence that you have got to look again at what lies at the center of those worlds before the center fell apart. Because there is where we find the real genius. And that is what we have to relate to because we have to feed on that genius. You must have models. You must have role models. You must see a figure that you can relate to with pride before you can change. Jesus was able to change people because Jesus was a role model of what was perfect in human consciousness and behavior. That is why for 2,000 years, he has affected humanity. He may not have completely changed it, but he profoundly affected it. He overturned the Roman Empire. He overturned the values in that Roman world. He was able to do that because he stood as a thread of fire. You have to have those figures of fire in your mind. You can't just have darkness. You can't just be overwhelmed by the darkness of the world. You have to be aware of it. You have to be realistic. But if you're utterly overwhelmed by it, and if that's all you feed on, you are not going anywhere. Don't kid yourself. The power to overturn a world lies in some kind of hope. You have to be able to go back into a path that you could feed upon the strength. When I went to Africa, I had spent two years in England studying Africa. I was still ashamed because nobody in my school, no professor ever told me anything good about Africa, unless it was some condescending thing. They have nice stories about animals. That was my Swahili literature teacher. They have very fine rituals, they dance well, they have nice clothes. But when it comes to any serious intellectual activity, no, I had to learn that by studying African writers. I came to my pride in Africa, not through anthropology, not through history which didn't exist. I made that history. I had to research that history. I had to find it later. I came to it through literature because it's in literature. Studying Wole Shiyinka and Amos Tuchola and and the, the great figures in West African literature, and I began to read those novels, then I realized that there was a different thing that I had not yet seen. 
that had never been presented to me. And when I got into Africa, I was sent there simply to help collect a number of linguistic terms. And even though I digress from my subject, I should return to it. It's important that you understand from people's lives what is happening in the world, not just facts from books, because people are walking books. And they're the best books in the end if they really know to tell their story, if they really understand what happened to them. I was sent there just to collect a number of legal terms in Swahili. I was speaking Swahili fluently after two years. I'd been trained in London as Zanzibar, who had escaped during the revolution, taught me to speak Swahili fluently. He was one of my teachers. And I went there, and I was to just collect these legal terms. And I looked around me, and you become aware suddenly of the absurdity. Slowly it is dawning on you, but you, there comes a time when the shock of a situation dawns on you with absolute clarity. It's like hearing Reagan lie every day, and then suddenly he gets caught in the lie. And then you see with... And then you see the expression in his face. Have you noticed his face recently? Yes. Study it closely, how he bunches it together. Try to smile the old smile and it's not working anymore because he's been caught, frozen in the line. All the while it worked, suddenly it doesn't work anymore. You could see with glaring clarity for the first time, you could see right through the crook. Now that, or through the crack, to the crook. That is what happened to me in Africa. Suddenly as if a crack opened in the world, in my civilization, and I could see right through to what I was doing, where I was, what this was all about. Here are these Englishmen sitting in an independent country, making up a dictionary for these people, using their own concepts of the law, although they're being pushed out. And if these people are trying to bring a new, lang a new language to the law which they could work within, they're bringing back all, they're bringing their old concepts that do not relate to that. And it is then when I began to see what colonization means when it affects imagination. That you could change power and you could turn from a white to a black and you're going to still be doing the same damn thing because this hasn't changed. And this does not change until you begin to understand where you come from. You can't change consciousness unless you change your vision of history. Because the present is in the past. It didn't suddenly come up like that. It has roots in that history, that, or that false vision of history. Diop had the greatest opportunity in the world. He wasn't like me. I was very unfortunate, very fortunate in being unfortunate. I grew up in the bush. Diop had the best education. He came out and he went straight, bright young man, straight into the university in Paris. But one thing saved him, he was arrogant, independent. He didn't want to do anything easy. He wanted to challenge the establishment. So he wrote a thesis an African origin of Egyptian civilization. This, of course, was rejected because that is absurd. Africans created Egyptian civilization. And the brought massive arguments to establish it was rejected. Do you know, just two months ago, the university who rejected him wrote me asking me to send me a copy of the book I edited on the up. Sheepishly, I told them I don't send out complimentaries. Please send a check. <laughs> Diop challenged the establishment. Eventually, after 10 years, he won his case. Diop showed, first of all, he actually invented, developed a method to test the melanin in the skin of the Egyptian mummy. He got mummies from the Museum of Man, where he was allowed to, to operate. And Diop took off inches of skin. And Diop told me, do you know there were people who were doing that that discovered it already? Because when I went to take off the skin, I found some of the mummies, all the skin had been taken off. <laughs> Not a word. They knew. They hadn't said a word. 
Diop used that evidence to show the dosage of melanin in the skin established their African origin. He showed the language, and that is the most powerful argument. Diop painstakingly built up a case showing that the linguistic connection between Egyptian and the interior languages of Africa showed beyond the shadow of a doubt that these not Asians came in or Caucasians came in to make Egypt. They're speaking an African language. Even in Uganda today, the Ik are speaking Middle Egyptian. Do you know that? I was started to find that out two weeks ago. Somebody called me out of the blue and told me, have you seen a recent book in which they show that the Ik of Uganda are speaking Middle Egyptian? He showed that the iconography, that is the statues, the statues that were made of these people, and there were all sorts of statues, you know. When these guys are photographing, they pick, they would pick a statue that has, you know, sometimes Egyptian has an eyebrow. This is painted, you know. This has nothing to do with his real features. They have painted things and so forth, and they would photograph that to make them look like Asiatics, etc. When the very black ones are there, like when, the, in order to be a god, you have to be very black. Even if you, in real life you are reddish brown or dark brown or various shades of black, to be a god you have to be pure black because for the Egyptians that was the color of divinity. Okay, and Osiris is called the great black. When they were bringing King Tut here, they had several statues that were very black. The one that was very, very black, they said they couldn't bring it, it was too fragile to travel. <laughs> He showed, he told me, he said, when I saw Ramesses II, before they took him, because he's one of the few men who were invited, he said, when I saw Ramesses II, before they took him to Paris, he was very black. He said, Van, he was as black as I am, and Diop is very black. When the Ramesses II came back, he was white. <laughs> I mean, he was whiter than white as they say in the, the ad, okay? He, they had put gamma ray radiation down on that poor fellow. I mean, he's been dead for thousands of years, poor fellow. But they had put the gamma ray radiation on him until they had taken all evidence of pigmentation out of his skin. Well, not the upset, you could still prove pigmentation, but the appearance was no longer black. Do you understand that? I mean, these guys are not fooling around. I mean, you would think, you know, that is something that has always bothered me. You have all the power in the world. You control everything. Even independent countries, you control their trade, their monetary policy, etc., their goods, their markets, everything. You have everything in the world. How could you be afraid of us? You know, how could you be afraid of history? which just seeks to balance things out. I mean, what is this curious xenophobia, as the op calls it, this fear of others, fear of strangers? It began, they say, in the ice. I don't know about that. But I do know that it is very, very strange that the one thing that distinguishes the African, even when he invades, he, is, he has a certain openness. When I come to deal with the Moors, I will explain that to you. Whereas when the European invaded, with few exceptions, like in the case of the Greek invasion of Egypt, he fears deeply the stranger, so deeply that he seeks to wipe him out in every way possible, either to smash his nose and his lips, or to take the gun and aim it at the Sphinx. Do you know that that was pure fear here were the French on the Napoleon entering Egypt for the first time. And then they saw all the great wonders, the pyramids standing there. How could that be related to a black people who, as Bonnie had said, had become our slaves, our servants? And they looked to the Sphinx, and there it was, with that godlike authority staring down at them, the broad forehead, the big nose the full lips, staring down with a godlike authority, and they took the cannon and blew off its nose. 
I discovered through a friend that the splinters of the Sphinx nose were in the back room in the British Museum. And it was through me and the up urging Mukhtar, Gamel Mukhtar, the Egyptian, who was in charge of one of the UNESCO branches for the peopling of Egypt, the peopling of Africa project, that the Egyptians eventually got the splinters of the Sphinx nose back from Britain. The British at first refused, they couldn't return everything they said if people started making claims, what would be left? So they gave it back on what they call permanent loan. It's on permanent loan. Diop showed, apart from language, apart from the question of melanin, apart from the question of the iconography, that is the statues, he showed other things as well. He showed blood groups. It is possible now to distinguish races. There are certain factors like the Diego factor, the Sutter factor, etc. You can, you can make distinctions. The Kel factor, you can make distinctions on, along those lines. He showed distinctions in terms of skeletal evidence, how it was selectively classified, how they start talking about the brown race. Since it wasn't the white race, and it wasn't a yellow race, the, and it couldn't be a black race because the blacks are not real people, so it's a brown race. So they call it a Eurafrican race. In other words, it's a European African. And they, they have to men, mix and melt these things together in order to make it work. Rather than admit that here you have Africans who were there at the beginning of the world moving up through Africa because Egypt is in Africa, why can't there be 10,000 years ago Africans in Africa? <laughs> you, could you understand, even at the Cairo conference in 1974, a man called Abdullah, who's an Egyptian, not a real Egyptian, one of the modern ones that live in Egypt today, when the up showed that the Greeks and the Romans said that the Egyptians were black. They saw them. They weren't guessing. They were there. They invaded them. They saw they were black. They knew they were dealing with black people. Abdullah said they were burnt by the sun. Even if they're black, they're white. They may be black skinned, but they're white. And one of them actually insisted that there were no Negroids in the world until about 10,000 years ago. I heard that when I was a boy, when Schweitzer, who was one of the most famous men in the world of South African, liberal, he said that the Negro is my brother, but he is my younger brother by several centuries. I felt so good about that. At least he said we are his brother, <laughs> even though we are his younger brothers by several centuries. It took me years and years and years before I realized that the opposite is true. We are his elder brothers. And we are not only elder in terms of age, but our civilizations were elder civilizations. The key, the whole key lay in Tarsetti. And I am sorry that I had written they came before Columbus before they found Tarsetti. Because when I write that book again, I have to change the chapter of Egypt. Because that was the missing link. And the trouble was that that was discovered before I had written my book, but not a word was said. In 1962, the Russians, the Germans, the Americans, the English, all of them went down into Egypt and Nubia because the Russians had built the Aswan Dam for the Egyptians. And when they were when the flood waters were let loose, it would sink part of Nubia and many critical things would be lost. So these archaeological teams went down to study and the American team came upon the most extraordinary discovery. They found a large cemetery on the edge of the Sudan. This is a place called Kusta, Q-U-S-T-U-S, Kusta. And they found 33 tombs. These were such enormous tombs and they had such great wealth in them, so many vessels and pottery and so forth, that they were convinced they were royal tombs. 
They hastily picked up the pieces, put them in many crates, and brought them back to the United States, to Chicago. They said they spent 16 years putting the pieces together. In 1979, a man named Bruce Williams came forward and announced, and this is on the front page of the New York Times, that they had found the oldest monarchy in the Middle East, which really should be called the Nile Valley, a place called Tarseti, and that there they had found a pharaonic civilization already in place before the first Egyptian dynasty. And where is this civilization? On the edge of the Sudan. And when I first asked, well, are those black people? Well, we don't know that. <laughs> what we know is on the edge of Sudan, but it could be any color. That doesn't really matter. You know, when they find people in Europe and you say, are they white? Of course. <laughs> but when you find people in an old dynasty that upsets all the theories, are they black? Well, we don't know about that. That doesn't really matter. They're people. <laughs> that is a really odd business. You know how we had to push and push Bruce Williams before we got him to admit that those couldn't be Caucasians. We had to use tricks in order to get him to that because he doesn't want to be pulled into this con a controversy. You will see a picture of him with us at the Nile Valley Conference, I invited him. I, I split the cultural nationalist movement by inviting Bruce Williams, but I knew I had to invite him because I knew that that was the critical evidence and I knew it took some courage on his part to do what he did because his master, his teacher, kept that a secret. It is because the man who was in charge of that expedition, Keith Steele, died that we know now about Tarsetti this early. And recently, Bruce Williams wrote me, and I published it um, in the Nile Valley Civilization, showing that they not only found the pharaonic civilization in Nubia, but it existed side by side, parallel with the Egyptian dynasties. Even when things started to crack up and move in Egypt, they had this parallel, parallel pharaonic civilization continuing for a long time. But what is important there is that the critical piece that was to prove that Ethiopia created Egyptian civilization and black people therefore did it was a piece that wasn't broken at all. They said they spent 16 years putting the pieces together, but the piece that was critical didn't need putting together. It was there complete at the beginning, and that was in the back room. It was an incense burner in which you could see the falcon god Horus in which you could see the palace facade that were later used by the Egyptians, in which you could see the crown on the, the head of the black king. Ten to twelve black kings reigned in Ethiopia as pharaohs before the first pharaoh sat on the throne of Egypt, and they moved up into the Egyptian world. The impact of Egypt on Greece which means the impact of early African civilization on European civilization was profound. I can only give you a faint glimpse of it. When you hear Diop speak on this, you are startled. It would take a book to fill the number of great scholars that came out of Europe to be fed and taught by the Africans. The impact on mathematics was immense. The Africans had developed highly advanced astronomy and mathematics. The second of time is African. The division of the day into exactly 24 hours is African. The division, the division of the week into ex the names of the week, the names of the days of the week are African. The de decision to start the day at midnight is African. Don't take that for granted. Not everybody starts the day at midnight. When I was in Tanzania, I found there were Africans who didn't start the day at midnight. I was told to catch a train at 6.20. And I turned to a girl standing on the platform in Dar es Salaam, and I said in Swahili, what is the time? And she said, it is now 10 to 6 in Swahili. 
And then I said, when does the train come? And she said, Kesho. Kesho is means tomorrow. But tomorrow begins at six o'clock. Like a fool, I went away and I lost the train. <laughs> they didn't tell me that in England. They didn't tell me that in the dictionary. It was just my Kesho tomorrow. Kesho tom I learned it. Kesho tomorrow. Tomorrow begins at 12 o'clock. So we take a lot of things for granted. You know, the Europeans have filled our heads up with the idea that they made it all. They made the calendar. No, sir. The Babylonian calendar only had 365 days. It was wrong. It was the African in Egypt who created the first accurate calendar, 365 and a quarter days. That is very exact. That is the exact time it takes for the revolution around the sun. And the Africans dealt with it in this way. They took the quarter. Instead of creating a leap day, they created a leap year. You had to go through 1,460 years before you had the leap year. Then they were left with the 365. They had five festival days for the gods, and they were left with 360. That 360 was cut into 12 months of exactly 30 days each. Hence, the Africans created exact months. When the Greeks took over that calendar, they took the five festival days and mixed it up among the other days, and they took the quarter, which around 300 BC, the Egyptians with the, in, the, in, the, in the city of Alexandria had changed now and created a leap day. That was later pulled in so that we now have 28-day months, 29-day months, 30-day months, 31-day months. It needs a rhyme in order to remember which is which. The Africans created December the 25th as the day of the Christ. Horus was the Christ figure. Osiris was God and his son was Horus. The word Christ is an African word. It comes from K-R-S-T, Christ, Christ. It's an African word. There's nothing European about that. Jesus is the last and the most powerful of the Christ figures. That is the one we worship today because that is the most powerful, complete, and perfect of the Christ figures. But before he appeared on earth, the mythology and legend surrounding the Christ figure was already in motion in Africa. Africa had ready at the temples of Luxor. The Africans had, first they had the angel coming to tell the mother that the child was being born. Then they have the virgin conception. Then they have the three kings, which are three stars, which Egyptians call the three kings, which come out and are in conjunction at the time of the birth of the Christ figure. And then they have the resurrection on the third day, after the third day. All that was in Africa before Jesus, the Christ, the last of the living figures, the last of the consciousnesses that were perfect, sons of God, appeared. Okay, so that these are things already in Africa, as there were 17 breakthroughs in astronomy in Africa, which affect our volume. The inch is African. The cubit is African. The second of time is African. The second of arc is African. All of these things had already been created before the Europeans attacked the Egyptians and brought them back and started to claim they did this and they did that. Archimedes making claims that he did certain mathematical constructions and inclined plane and things like that. That was done 1,700 years before he was born. Sheikh Anthony brought us papyri, brought us a slice from the papyri. The books of early Africans, the earliest mathematical texts, even spite of the destruction of those texts, we still have the earliest books in the world are African. There are scraps from the mathematical treatises of Africans, which are still the earliest, which show clearly what they had done before. There are scraps from the medical theses. The medical books startle you beyond dreams. Doctors who have studied 
What early Africans did in medicine cannot understand how their medicine could be so modern. One of their books, 2600 BC, 1500 BC, the Ebers and Edwin Smith of Paris, they have chapters on helminthiasis, ophthalmology, gynecology, pregnancy diagnosis, treatment of abscesses and burns, studies of, of the pulse. We have evidence that Hippocrates stole, actually took sections out of their work. How many of opposites in medicine comes from the Egyptians? They have sections on practices of clavicle and dislocation of the mandible come straight out of the Egyptians. And all is claimed and all is pushed aside. These are the fathers of this and that. Here, little African, be content. We have dragged you out of the bush. You have never known civilization. You've invented nothing and explored nothing. Be grateful. You know it is still coming to look at our Ali Mansui in the Africa. He has the poor African, the sick African in the hospital, and he makes this statement. And he has this beautiful, cultivated, demeanor manner. So lots of black people like him. They don't know what he, they, that guy is doing to them. I know Mansui, you know. I know him through and through. I was a propagandist in the British government. I understand that mentality. I saw it inside out. And he comes with this charm. He, the African loves large families. Then he makes these large families and Western skills preserve them. And he has this European stabbing the African with the vaccine. Where the hell did the vaccine come from? He doesn't know that. Masrui doesn't know history. Knows nothing about African history. He picked this up in his college where we are taught, as I was taught like Masrui, that the Europeans created everything. The vaccine was developed in Africa centuries before Jenna. The Africans even had developed a smallpox vaccine because they don't have it today. It doesn't mean they didn't have it. You know how much the Africans lost? Do you think you could take millions of people out of a continent, drag the youth, a whole generation of people out of a continent, smash it up, rip it, the guts and heart out of Africa, take away its wealth, take away its structure, and drag these people across the ocean, shatter them, and then say, well, look at the African, they never did anything. When you take every blasted thing away from them, when they were on the edge of budgeting technology and then people come and tell you, oh, this is independence. Now, what independence does Africa really have? Could you have independence when the richest part of Africa, Southern Africa, is still in five hands? Could you talk of independence when the trade of these people, the monetary policy, all of these things are still controlled from outside? Don't kid yourself. Don't kid yourself. This is just the beginning, and we have to become deeply involved in this because it's not going to change by sitting down and talking absolute rubbish like Masrui. He knows absolutely nothing about the beginnings of those crises. He may be good as a political scientist, but he deeply despises the African. He comes and he says, look at the poor African. The African believes that Animals have souls. And here is this brutal European. He comes and shoots all the animals. And everybody cheers. Oh, brutal European. This nice African who believes in souls for animals. And we really believe that shit. We really do. Because that is what we are taught. We really believe that you have to be a nice human being. We are nice human beings. That's all we are good for. That is why Songor, Leopold Songor, could get up the president of Senegal and say, emotion is Negro, reason is Greek. So it is the white people who have reason, the white people who have science, and we are the nice people who have emotion. That's absolute rubbish. And we have to get away from that nonsense. Don't let any people be condescending to you and tell you what nice human beings you are. Human beings are human beings. There are nice and bad human beings. We have just as much right to the technological legacy of the world as any other people. And not because of any period 
that has been taken away from us, we assume that we are not a part of that. Look, I have been in the space program. I was flown in the military aircraft by the United States up to Cape Kennedy to witness the blast off of the space shuttle. You would be amazed how many blacks are responsible for that. Not the Challenger explosion. Because that was where the engineer, the, not the engineers, the managers at Pia Paul who wanted the damn thing to go up and meet the schedule even though they knew the steel was off. But let me tell you, when you meet those great scientists, when you meet people like Colonel Gregory, whom I met at Cape Kennedy, when you meet people like Major Gillum IV, who supervised the space program and brought that space shuttle from babyhood to blast off, when you meet scientists in our telecommunication industry, people like James West, critical developments in glass, I will like guys, critical developments in medicine, critical developments in space, even today, oppressed as we are, pushed aside as we are, when you realize how much blacks is given to the technology of the world, you are absolutely amazed. But you don't see that on the Africans. You have Masrui standing on a river, and he says, Africans never wanted to explore anything. They were not imperialistic. They didn't want to invade anybody, so they fished. They didn't go anywhere, they fished. And lots of black people say, oh, that's nice. They're nice people. That, that's how people, you are fooled. Every, and all you have to do, all you have to do is to make a few remarks against the white people. And blacks think, oh, that's so liberal. That guy's attacking white people, so he must have something to say. That's easy stuff. White people would pay you to attack them so they could get their point over. You think they spend millions of dollars on those films and those books, you know, for the next generation or two, we're going to be affected by those films and those books. That's going to be the ruling thing. And when you, when you challenge them, I'll challenge them, you know, um, no, you, you can't challenge us, you know, it's an African doing it. Always get the black man to do their dirty work. And then he seems so sophisticated and, oh yes, the Europeans did this and look, these lovely Africans and so But he's really telling you, these are nice backward people. That's, what, that's the major thing. They're nice backward people and the, the Europeans mistreated them a, book, a bit. But basically it's the structure of their society and their kind of mentality and temperament that brought them to this pass. He tells you about colonialism only existed for 100 to 150 years, so the African can't blame this on colonialism. What on earth does he know about the history of Africa? What on earth? Look, he said he saw the up every year, he said. Never once in any of his films does he mention Egypt as having black people in it. Madhuri doesn't believe that. You hear any great civilization, you see any great African in that series? No. Always there is this concentration. And it's not only on the Greeks who were to form the basis and the groundwork for later European civilization. The Moors, that is the most important, the, one of the most important things, that the basis for the Industrial Revolution, which was laid in Europe, was laid because of the Moors. Because Europe, after the brilliance of Greece and Rome, some of which, as I said, was a borrowed brilliance, fell into a dark age. And then came Muhammad. And Muhammad, like Jesus, rose above the stupidity and blindness of his people. It's not the Arabs made Muhammad, it's Muhammad made the Arabs, it's not the Jews made Christ. Christ rose above the Jews. It is the Jews who ordered Christ to be killed. I'm not attacking Jews now, I'm just telling you a fact that Christ, because of his behavior, Jesus, I better call him Jesus, the Christ. Because Jesus challenged the high priest of the church, that is why the church saw to the crucifixion of Jesus. Jesus picked up the whip in the church and raced them out because he felt they had abominated the temple of God. He was a Jew, okay, but he transcended the blindness and the narrowness of the Jews of his time. 
He created a universal religion. The same thing is true of Muhammad. He was an Arab, but he transcended the warring tribes of the Arabs. Just like Christ, he was nearly killed by them. In fact, the years of the Muslims begin with the flight of the Hegara, when Muhammad and his followers were nearly destroyed. But in his death, just as in the death of Christ, came a great crusade. And the Arabs ran into China, they ran into India, they ran into Africa. And there in Africa, the most significant thing happened. They married, intermarried with African women. They converted certain Africans. And with the Africans, they moved into Europe. The Africans and the Arabian types struck Europe in 711 AD. Went up and took over Spain, part of Portugal, small part of France. And there they built a new civilization. There lay the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. For the major industries of Europe were there among the Moors. The first hot and cold water system in Europe was among the Moors. The first state streets in Europe were done in Spain among the Moors. The first lighted streets in Europe were done among the Moors. The first air conditioning in Europe were done by the Moors. Even the gun was not invented by Europeans. The Russians have shown manuscripts, the Arabs using the gun, the fire stick against the Indians in early campaigns. The gun was brought into Europe. No genius, sudden flash of genius of the European. The gunpowder, they found that Africans had already created gunpowder in Egypt. They were using it for different purposes. They have found African gunpowder in West Africa. It was found by a, a, a Nigerian geophysicist. Chinese had gunpowder. All that was brought into Europe. Europe did not develop the chemistry of gunpowder. Even the ships, which were so critical to the movement of peoples across the Atlantic. Look at Columbus and Vespucci. What kinds of sails did they use? Arab Latin sails that were used, being used by Arabs and Africans on the Indian Ocean. Chinese report, Africans bringing elephants to them in ships in the 13th century, two centuries before Columbus. The astrolabe was not developed in Europe. The compass was not developed in Europe. It is true that after the massive and continuous movement of the ships in this area out of the greed for gold, it is true that European hulls improved, European sails improved. Other peoples were thrown into eclipse, the American and the African, and thus Europe gained the technological ascendancy. But the roots of that technology, the roots of many of its great mathematics, numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, that's not European. That's Hindu, brought by the Moors into Europe. When the Europeans first saw numbers, Europeans didn't have numbers, you know. Greeks and Romans were using letters for numbers. Egyptians had ciphers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and ciphers. They had other ciphers for those, but they didn't use letters. They had ciphers. Europeans didn't have ciphers. You know, take the Romans. The Romans have X for 10, X, I, 11, X, I, 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 X, V, M, C, C, V, M, and things like that. Letters. They used for numbers, clumsy. And these numbers, when they were first introduced by Fibonacci, who had visited India, the Europeans would not accept them. The church said numbers are works of the devil. That's a church in Europe. It was a capital offense in the 17th century to study advanced mathematics. Capital offense, you could be killed for it. It is not an accident that many of the few individual geniuses in Europe were crucified, sacrificed, in prison, killed. Socrates had to drink poison because they brought foreign doctrines, foreign science into Europe. So please understand this. Become aware of the profound legacy that has come out of the African world. You can make a connection with this. This is real. I am not being metaphysical. When I was in Africa, and I was there under the worst possible auspices, that was the beginning of my real life. It is as if I died there and started all over again. And I will never forget, <coughs> sitting in my room above the clouds, 
in the Uluguru Mountains in Tanzania. Just above the city, which was the lost city of Simbamani. And I felt power surge through me as it had never surged through before. It almost burst my circuits. I could work for 12 hours a day in that world without being tired. And I began there to write the dictionaries for Healy Legal Tongue. It never mattered very much to me what I was actually doing because I don't even have the dictionary now. It's in specialist libraries in London, in Germany, in Tanzania, etc. I don't even know where it is. I know the immigration has a copy and Rutgers has a copy. Because I've gone on to do other things. But the important thing was to know that suddenly, like if light, lightning had burst in one's brain, that one was being fed, you felt the connection, you felt that something could come out, like an umbilical cord that could link you to something that was there. It was like if some strange electricity had come from the ancient world to feed my circuits. That has never left me. The sense of energy, the sense of being able to move like a laser beam. The sense of being able to pull things to me that I wanted when I was doing, they came before Columbus. How do you think I developed that bibliography? There was no bibliography like that in the world. I would walk through libraries and stop in places and open books and there were things. It is as if you reached a certain point where you could pull to yourself the things that you needed. This is not metaphysics, it is real. We live in a world where we have lost ourselves. We live in a world where we have been broken and shattered for centuries. We live in a world where when we look around us, whether it's the film or whether it's in our books, we are always just pieces of ourselves thrown all over the place. In order to reconstruct our history, it was like looking at a, an airplane that had exploded in the mid middle of the sky. And I had to go and pick up all the little pieces to find the black box where we have found the black box. We know why we crashed. And we know where the pieces are. Let us put them together. Because in putting them together, we can take that shattered psyche and make it whole again. We can heal ourselves. We can redeem the living present through the so-called dead past. But the past is not dead. What happened 10,000 years ago or 10 minutes ago occupies the same time space in consciousness. We are one with that past. And we are one with the African people out of whom we have come out, out of that womb we have come. And we have to go forward into a new world, recreating ourselves as we go on, drawing from that power, that great history, which is ours. Thank you. Dr. Ivan Van Sertema, give him another round. All right. All right, brothers and sisters, we're going to give Dr. Van Sertema an opportunity to catch his breath. And then we're going to go right into our question and answer period. But before we do, we have to. Um, no, no, I don't have a question to break. I am from Guyana. Oh, really? I am from uh, your, your father. From the country for a whole lady. And I contribute, and I want to see. You knew it from? Yes, his father. So he, I, I heard him yesterday, and I was just like, I come to greet him. I don't know who I am. I don't know who I am. Thank you. I am in the first one that. And uh, I came here before, and I did enjoy the program. My question is, what does black people have to do with um, Babylon as far as um, Christianity or, or the gods that was worshipping down there? And the second Ooh. question No, no, no. Is, Let me answer the first. Okay. You can only answer, ask one because we only have 10 minutes. Okay. From what my understanding, Babylon was part of that Sumerian world, okay? It's an early civilization which 
is roughly the same time of the early dynasties of Egypt. But in fact, though many people have tried to argue that it is precedes Egyptian civilization, this has not yet been established. What we do know is that in the Sumerian world, okay, we have certain areas like Elam and Sumer where you have a dominant black presence. Babylon, however, is not of one race. Babylon involved Asiatic types as well, and it may even have involved some of the Caucasoid nomads of the period, because as, as we know, we know, we have cultures in Europe very, very early, but we do not have civilization. Civilization is something that came much later with the Greeks, so that at the time of Babylon, you do not have any advanced European civilization. You have advanced African civilization. You do also have outreaches of by the Asian. Okay, so that Babylon is a is a mixing, a melting of things. Okay. Thank okay. You. Yes, uh, you said that Jesus Christ was a Jew, and yes. that those who crucified or, or went ahead with him being killed were Jews. No, no, the Jews didn't crucify Christ. The Jews. Uh, got the Romans to crucify right. Christ. Okay, the Romans were in charge of the world. The Jews could not do something like that because that would be against the law. It's only the government can crucify someone. But the point was that it wasn't, I'm not saying that the Jews as Jews crucified Christ, but the Christ antagonized Jesus the Christ, okay, because there are other Christ figures. Jesus antagonized the Jewish high priest. He antagonized the Jewish hierarchy of the time because he challenged some of their tenets. So that when Pontius Pilate said, look, we have these two men. I have tested Jesus and found him to be innocent. Here is Barabbas. Why don't you take Barabbas? And they say, no, we don't want Barabbas. We want Jesus. Okay, so that he had antagonized them. Yes. But my question is, uh, uh, the, the Jews of who you refer to, did they look like the Jews that we see today? No, 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 but they, they weren't all black either. Because you see, in the Egyptian world, you have black Jews, because the Jews were not a race. Even today, they're not a race, okay? Though you have a predominance of European Jewry, okay? You have the predominant type among the Jews today is white. The predominant type among the Jews at that time were black, okay? But you do have Jews who were not black. If you, for example, in the Pentateuch, you would find Abraham is white, he isn't black. Um, his wife is black. Or no, Moses' wife is black, not Abraham's wife. You could, see Abra you could see pictures of the early Egyptians against some of the Jewish patriarchs. You could see the Jewish patriarchs are of a different color than some of those early Egyptians. So you do have black Jews, and you do have fair-skinned Jews even in an early time. So because it was a sect, it wasn't a race, okay? So that you do have you do have a dominance or predominance of black types among the Jews in a certain period. Yes. Uh, Dr. Sotomayor, I enjoyed the lecture very much. Uh, I'd like for you to, very briefly, um, and if I've heard the term Moreno. Uh, Moreno? Yes, sir. Yeah, I don't know anything about it. Uh, well, I, I, I'm trying to find the term that refers to the Moors. Uh, you, you mentioned the Moors in Spain. And um, could you briefly uh, deal with uh, what I would call, what Fanon called the uh, phenomena of uh, Negrophobia in, uh, in what you would call the English and Spanish speaking cultures, the Negrophobia? Mm -hmm. No, and that, that is quite. Um, one of the things that you have to get very clear in your head, the Moors today are not the Moors I'm talking about. Just like mm -hmm. the Egyptians today are not the Egyptians we are talking about. The Moors have become a very mixed people. You could go in so-called Moorish countries and find very few blacks. Just like you could go in Egypt and find very few blacks among the dominant people. When Sadat said, I'm a black man and I'm the first to fear in 2,000 years, he was making the distinction between himself and many other members of his cabinet. The Negro, phobia, fear of the Negro, or hatred of the Negro, or contempt of the Negro, that's quite understandable. I don't think that needs a discussion. That grew out of the slave trade, and it became very advanced. Not in all contexts, in all history, do you have contempt of the black. That's not true. The black is worshipped in many contexts. Even in Europe, the black is worshipped. 
The God of chastity is a black woman. The God of wisdom is a black woman. The God of um, the, the, some of the greatest um, heroines like Andromeda is a black woman. Circe is a black woman. And Perseus, the Greek hero, marries the black Andromeda. So that you do not have all through history, you do not have contempt or hatred of the black. Those are things that came afterwards. When they actually begun, I don't know. There are some people who've attempted to answer that question, the origins of racism. Um, but I do know that it, it isn't automatic. There's nothing automatic about it. Okay, thank you. Yes, okay. Yes, I think you gave a good lecture today, Dr. Van Soderman. Thank you. My question is about language. You mentioned that in Africa there were many scripts. The Minoic, the Mandi. Not the many, Bacan. half a dozen. There are only half a dozen in Europe, too. There is, in Africa, you have the Mande script, which we have evidence of still. We have the Meroitic script, of which we have about 800 and something texts, which is still awaiting decipherment. We have the hieroglyphic script, which we can establish clearly now is African, because we find the beginnings of it at Tarsetti before it moves up into Egypt. We have the Akan script, both a drum script and a written script. We have the Afaka which, which we find among the Surinamese brought out of Africa. Europe only has about half a dozen scripts, too. Europe has the Greek script. Um, Europe has the Roman script. And some aspects of the Roman script is borrowed. Europe has the Phoenician script, and half of the Phoenician script is African influence. Europe has the Russian script. You don't have many other scripts in Europe. My question is, how many scripts of cipher are there that that existed in Africa. I mean, how many ciphers? Script, right. We, we don't know. Oh. Cipher is not a script. Cipher is using something to represent a number. Okay, we don't know that. We don't even know how many scripts there are in Africa. That is still being studied. But we do know that the Africans, even at this point of discovering research, we do know the Africans had as many scripts as the Europeans. Thank yes. you. Okay. Yeah, I just would like to say good evening to you. I'd like to ask you, is there an earlier recorded date before 4241 BC in which the Egyptians introduced the solar, the solar calendar? Not the Egyptians, the Ethiopians. The Ethiopians. Yes, okay. Is there an earlier recorded date before that, uh, 4241 BC, in which they introduced that solar well, calendar? Well, we are assuming that it was then. And the reason why we assume that is because of the use of this 1460. Um, we don't know that they actually recorded that date, but the, the assumption is that since they could go back and go forward, that that is a sort of starting date at which they would make the count, okay? But there are earlier dates, but we are not sure about them, you see, because the problem that is occurring is that a lot of carbon dating remains to be done, mm -hmm. okay? We, will, we are finding earlier things than we expect. Every year we are getting startled. We thought, for example, that man was only about 3 million years, and then last year we found that they have 5 million year old things in Africa. Then we thought that modern man was only about so many thousands of years old, and now we find modern man in Africa 100,000 years old. So you see, we're still finding things. The thing that is very encouraging is that every time we find something new, it consolidates, it proves the point, okay? In other words, nothing is being found that breaks down the movement in that direction. Every time we find something, like we find pastoral uh, arts, art of mining cattle in Africa earlier, much earlier than we thought, earlier even than Asia, we finding agricultural settlements in Africa earlier than elsewhere in the world. So even though the dates keep changing as we find new things, they're going back rather than being more recent. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, you said something about the modern man, the Homo sapien that was found in Africa. Homo sapien sapien. Uh, is that also the Homo habilis? No, I don't know about that. You see, they have all sorts of names, but let me suggest to you stick to these names, okay? These are the official terms. At the beginning, there's Australopithecus. Mm -hmm. There are two Australopithecines, Australopithecus bosai, Australopithecus gracile. Then comes what they call Homo habilis, and there are lots and lots of names, but stick with that. 
then comes Homo erectus, and then lots of names for that too. Then comes Neanderthal man, then comes who is called Homo sapiens, then comes Homo sapiens sapiens, which is us, all of us. Okay, okay. thank you very thank much. You. Okay, I'm gonna have to cut it. Sorry about that, but Dr. Van Sudema has to has to leave.